Uh, we start precisely at 4 o'clock. Uh, Bangalore International Center does that, and if we don't start at 4, they kick us out. So um, <laughs> uh, there may be people wandering in over time. I know with traffic, it's, it's sometimes tough to get here. Uh, so I'm Carl Malamut. I run Public Resource. I am joined by Lawrence Liang. Uh, Lawrence is the uh, dean of the Ambedkar uh, School of Law, Ambedkar University, Delhi. Uh, Om Shiva Prakash manages a huge scanning operation, and you're going to hear more about that as we go along. Uh, a noted Wikipedian and Mozillan and open source guy. Uh, also has done amazing work putting uh, 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 resources in the Kannada language online. Uh, so we're going to today tell you a little bit about, about what we're doing uh, here, about where we want to bring things, uh, and what people can do to help us. Um, so. I, I've been working in India for a long time, but this, this whole effort of servants of knowledge, of scanning things and putting them online, oh, started at you know, maybe 2018 or 2017. Uh, and for a while there, I was buying every government book I could find, um, and books that are out of copyright, you know, things like the Asian Educational Services series, uh, the reprints of old books, um, and shipping them back to the US and scanning them and putting them online. Um, and uh, in 2019, we managed to ship a scanner over um, and install it at the Indian Academy of Sciences. Uh, we scanned all the Indian Academy of Sciences work. Uh, we got two more scanners uh, through customs, uh, although they did sit in storage for a year. Um, and we had to pay a considerable sum of money in storage charges in order to get them back out of customs. Uh, we actually make our own scanners now in India. Um, and these are sophisticated devices. You might have seen the publicity for this event. Um, they are tabletop scribes. Uh, there's a large frame with LED lights in it. There's two high-end cameras, and there's a cradle for the book. And you, you hit a pedal, and the cradle goes up to the glass. It takes pictures. You uh, take your foot up, uh, the, the cradle goes down, you flip the page. And if you get good at these devices, you can scan 500 pages in an hour uh, on a sustained basis once, once you learn how to use these. These are sophisticated devices. Your scans are high resolution. They go into a computer. Uh, they get assembled. We double check them. Did we get every page? We, we say where page one is, right? So if there's front matter, page I, page II, page one. We label that. And that means that later on, when you want to go to page one, you can do that. Or you want to go to page 15, you can do that. And so we do that, and then there's something called um, like the, the publication process. Um, and in the publication process, we de-skew the pages, right? We make sure that they're straight. We de-warp them because the pages may curve a little bit. Um, we check for image quality. Uh, it get run through optical character recognition. And when we first began this, the Internet Archive, which is a nonprofit organization we work with and we push our materials there, they didn't do Indian languages. And so what we would do is we'd take the scans and we'd bring them down, we'd throw them over to Google, we'd do the OCR, and then we'd shove them back into the Internet Archive. Now since then, they have figured out how to do um, OCR in pretty much every language, so we don't do OCR anymore. Uh, there's a whole set of other processes of derivation. Uh, so you have JPEG-2 files, very high resolution. Those get assembled into a PDF file, right? They get turned into an ebook. They get put online with the metadata. Uh, and then we go through and we try to fix the metadata. So we've done that for the Indian Academy of Sciences. We had a scanner over at the uh, World Konkani Center and have done a thousand books in, in Konkani, uh, one of the larger collections. We had a scanner at the Roja Muthaya um, Memorial Library in, in Chennai and scanned those. And then COVID hit. And you know, with COVID, it was really hard to keep people employed. Buildings were shutting down. And so we consolidated our operations back in Bangalore and approached the National Law School of India University and said, you know what? We'll scan your library. And so we're, now that we're building our own scanners, we, we um, have nine scanners over at the National Law School of India University. We've scanned roughly 25,000 books. We're scanning 12.5 lock pages every month. 
and we are in the process of doubling our capacity. We just opened a second scan center at the BM Shri Library, and we are in the process of getting that up to speed and beginning to scan those materials. We work a lot with born digital materials as well. Um, and so, for example, the Public Library of India is what I call it on the Internet Archive. Um, we've got 7.5 locked pages, uh, books uh, uh, there. And we have like 50,000 books in Sanskrit. Uh, we have books in Gujarati. We have 100 different languages there, a very significant number. Many of those are mirrors of digital archives that were out there. The, the West Bengal Public Library, for example. We, we have that collection, the Archaeological Survey of India, um, the Tamil Virtual Academy. Uh, but we have other collections that are very carefully curated. And the, my baby is the Hind Swaraj collection. Um, and I've been working on that for quite a while. We have the uh, complete collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, the complete works of, of Ambedkar, uh, the entire run of the selected works of Nehru, uh, works of Radhakrishnan, speeches of presidents, speeches of prime ministers, um, lots of other very interesting books. Um, other collections, there's 20,000 movies and audio in the Indian culture collection. Um, a whole bunch of others. Uh, Jay Gyan is a top level collection, Victory to Knowledge. Um, and if you go there, you'll see 40 um, sub collections are available. Um, so there's things people can do to help us out. Um, our Telugu books, for example, from the, uh, the government has something called the Digital Library of India, which is since defunct. And I made a copy before it went down. Um, the people that did that, they would take all the Telugu titles and they transcribe them into Roman script. And there's a standard for doing that, but they didn't use the standard. They, they just made it up as they went along. And, and so we had a volunteer, Arjuna, uh, went through uh, by hand and recast every one of the titles uh, into Telugu script. Uh, we have other people going through all the Tamil titles and correcting the titles. And so they'll, they'll leave a review and they say the correct title is this. The correct author is this. Um, other people are going through the Sanskrit collections and adding finding aids, right? Different, different words uh, for accessing these materials. Um, in fact, Arjuna is here, uh, did a whole bunch of work uh, on, on the Telugu collection. Um, other people are uh, uploading books and they'll write to me and say, I've uploaded, you know, a thousand books to the community collection, but it's, it's really a coherent whole and we'll make a collection for them and move them all in there um, and then add them to the, the top level collection. So you can upload your books. We have other people going and um, they have books they have copyright uh, permission for, right? They go to the publishers or, or they are the rights holders and they'll, they'll upload them. Uh, we have other people that are interested in palm leaves Right? Um, or have materials that are available. What we can't do right now is, you know, you have a thousand books you want scanned and you, know, you can't just drop them off and we'll scan them for you. Uh, but if you have an interesting collection, you can go to OM and, you know, we might be able to scan a half dozen of them. Um, and in the future, what we're hoping is to expand our operation, right? So now we're nine scanners at the law school. Um, three scanners at, at BM Shri or four? Five, five, okay, so, um, and we're continuing to, to build more scanners. Uh, so those are, are professionals that operate those. They're people we pay, um, and we, we try to make sure the quality is consistent. We're hoping in the future maybe there's gonna be, you know, community scanning um, centers and things like that as we expand our operations. So the purpose of this session was to kind of introduce what we're doing uh, and tell you what's going on. Uh, let you know what's going on. So if you go outside uh, when you're done, there's a bunch of QR codes. Just take a picture of those, and that'll send you to the, the proper URIs on, on the Internet Archive. Or, or you can just go to the Internet Archive and, and search, right? Hin Swaraj is the name of my collection. Uh, Servants of Knowledge is the one that Ohm has been maintaining. Jay Gyan is the top level. You'll see a bunch of other stuff as well, but you, you can pretty quickly, if you see a collection that's got a million items in it, you know in the right place. Or you can just go to Google. That's another way to do it, right? Jagon site archive.org. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues, and then when we're done, I'm hoping there's a lot of questions. Uh, we have an audience mic here, so we're taping this. Uh, audience mic is right here at the front. Um, so after these guys are, are done speaking, we're hoping that you have questions, comments, and other things you can contribute. Um, so Lawrence Chang, uh, we're gonna let him uh, take over from here. 
Hi, everyone. You know, so um, <clears throat> I'm actually going to do two things. I'm going to speak about the law, um, because one of the crucial questions that arises um, with any project of this kind is, you know, what allows you to do it? And what's the relationship between copyright and what you want to do? But, you know, come on, it's a bit early in the evening to be talking about the law. So what I want to do instead is to try to give you a perspective, uh, looking at this idea of what the concept of the servant of knowledge might mean uh, to thinking about copyright. How can we think about copyright from the perspective of the servant of uh, servants of knowledge? Uh, and that's important for a number of reasons. Whenever you talk about copyright law, you tend to think about it in terms of ownership. Uh, so it's in that sense, you know, the master's perspective on, on property. Um, and I'm curious to think about what one could make as an argument or between an idea of an overt concept of, of copyright law and a um, covert concept of copyright law. What do I mean by this? Let's take the idea of the servant of knowledge. Copyright, philosophically, uh, is in many ways grounded in the thoughts of John Locke. And you know, the Lockean theory of labor uh, was the argument that if somebody exerts their labor, intellectual labor in this case, uh, they're entitled to the fruits of their labor. It's an argument that was grounded in, in a way in the coming together of the language of property and personhood and the birth in a way of liberalism. Um, what we rarely you know, get to know when we think about John Locke uh, outside of an, as an abstract philosopher is the concrete material realities of Locke's life. Uh, Locke, amongst other things, was actually one of the worst bosses that you could ever have. Um, amongst the various things that Locke had, was responsible for was a large number of penal legislations that actually, you know, resulting eventually in, in the death penalty um, for crimes against property. Uh, so he was the architect of various laws uh, that basically advocated greater kind of punishments. And if you look at the people who were actually you know, sentenced to death in the 18th century, um, a large number of them were actually servants. Right? So there's a brilliant book by Peter Leinborg uh, called The London Hanged. And it begins with this incredible line which says, there is no more curious word than the word capital in criminology and in economics. Because in the one, it represents life, like you know, capital investment, etc., And in the other, it represents death capital punishment. Uh, and his book is basically about the coming together of the two. And one of the characters who's very crucial in Peter Leinborg's account is John Locke. Uh, so amongst various things, you know, Peter Leinborg very laboriously describes uh, the completely problematic relationship that Locke had uh, to actual kind of, you know, to his actual servants. Um, and the number of cases, or large number of people who were hanged in that period were hanged for stealing, for example, two silver spoons, uh, a, a, a silk napkin, etc. So what does this allow us to do? If Locke, in some ways, stands for the conscious memory of the philosophy of copyright, what would it mean to think not so much from the master's perspective, but to think from the servant's perspective? And here, I want to actually offer a couple of empirical accounts of heroes or servants of knowledge who you will never find narrated in, let's say, at least copyright books. An English teacher who taught at St. Joseph's, many of us benefited from studying with him, etc., was a big fan of Saul Bellow, a um, huge fan of Saul Bellow. And he thought that he had all the Saul Bellow novels you know, that, that were around. And this is, of course, pre-internet days. Till on a trip to Madras, um, he finds that he discovers a Saul Bellow novel that he didn't have. Unfortunately for him, the library didn't allow him either to borrow the book or to photocopy the book. So what does the teacher do? He sits in the library over the next 10 days and copies the entire novel by hand, brings his entire notes to Bangalore, types out the entire novel, and then photocopies and cyclostyles and photocopies and gives it to his students. So if Walter Benjamin spoke about the work of art in the age of mechanical re reproduction, this is the work of love in the age of mechanical reproduction. The idea that practices and acts of transmission uh, can be a way in which a certain kind of affective excess uh, is put back into um, you know, an, an, an object of knowledge so that it acquires a density uh, of value rather than a depletion of value. Because the general story narrated in the history of copyright law is always about the copy being a taking away from. It's the copy depleting the value, especially economic value, of the original. 
which is kind of ironical and curious because if one were to actually look at the history, the etymological history of the word copy itself, it comes from copia, uh, which is the same root for the copious and the same for copulation. It's about reproduction, a, a form of reproduction which multiplies the value of rather than takes away the value of a particular object. And to my mind, the history of copyright seen from the perspective of servants of knowledge is really in a way an accounting of various forms of the addition of value uh, through the act of copying, through the act of reproduction, through the act of, of in, in our case, of course, you know, scanning, etc. Why does this become a way of thinking about a different account of copyright law itself? If one imagined you know, law having a conscious memory, a conscious in terms of its you know, reproduction in statutes, in legal judgments, etc., there is equally an argument that can be made of the unconscious memory of the law, right? So George Simmel, for example, says that gratitude is the moral memory of mankind. <clears throat> when that moral memory is legislated, it becomes contract law, right? What is a contra contract if not, you know, the ultimate idea of being bound by your words or being bound by a promise? Uh, so there is going to be a strong moral memory that resides underneath uh, what is a seemingly drab, boring legislation. Uh, and to my mind, it's important to actually excavate uh, the moral memory of what copyright law might be about. And it's that which then takes us to a small part of the legal. I'll just give you an overview so that we can talk about it you know, in, in, in the discussion. So what is the moral memory of, of copyright itself? Well, for one, copyright begins as a system of balance that is meant for the promotion of education. So the very first copyright legislation is a legislation called the Statute of Anne of 1706, which describes itself in its title as an act that is meant for the promotion of education. Right? So contrary to the popular belief that very many people have that copyright is supposed to be about the protection of the rights of authors or protection of property or in, of intangibles, etc., there is a deep, deep rooted idea of copyright being about the promotion of a particular conception of the public good. So how did this kind of, you know, turn away or happen where now we only associate copyright with, in a way, large industry, the protection of narrow interests, et cetera, and then what does it mean to recover the, the, the model memory? We're making an argument that fair use and fair dealing exceptions within copyright law are, is one of the sites where one can locate, in a way, this kind of contested model memory of, of copyright. And in India, in particular, it has a particular function to play. If one looks at, for example, the debates that took place in 1956 during the introduction of the Indian Copyright Act, and looks at, and if we go to the parliamentary debates, it's incredible because much before a constitutional recognition of the right to read was read into Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, that happened only in 1985. In 1956, the parliamentarians discussing copyright law were articulating it in terms of the language of the rights of the reader. And their question really was, you know, how do you actually have a system in which there is a recognition that this is not merely about the rights of authors or about the rights of publishers in general, but primarily foregrounding the rights of the reader. It's, an, it's a history that's been rarely discussed, rarely been brought into discussions on, on, on copyright itself. Um, and the other part of it is to actually think about this word, you know, uh, law. You always think about the idea of the law of copyright encompassing a whole range of things, including, for example, what are libraries entitled to doing? But much before copyright talked about libraries, in India you have you know, the laws of the library sciences. Anyone who comes from the world of library sciences knows that S. Ranganathan formulated these five incredible laws of the li library, which is every book has its reader. Uh, what are the others? Uh, it should be at the convenience of the reader. A library is not a, a library is a growing organism, etc. So one way of thinking about the idea of the unconscious of copyright law is to say that what are the normative sources that one should turn to in interpreting what the scope of Section 52, the fair use exception, in Indian law ought to be. We are contending that one, you locate it within constitutional principles of the right to read. Two, you call upon ideas of the laws of the library as not merely metaphorical laws, but actual concrete ways in which you interpret how a library ought to be designed, as well as what a design in terms of a regulatory design of a library ought to be. So in the Indian context, if you look at the exceptions, they're rather remarkable. They're remarkable for a number of reasons, because 
the Indian history of fair use is an explicit rejection of the universal story of copyright. The universal story of copyright culminates in 1984 with the TRIPS agreement and the establishment of a common minimum standard of intellectual property across all countries. Well acknowledged that the TRIPS agreement was primarily an agreement drafted by 30 lawyers representing Hollywood and the largest pharmaceutical industries, most developing countries did not have much of a say in the actual content of these laws. The only space then you had was some wriggle room by way of exceptions and limitations uh, that were allowed. And that's really where the Indian Copyright Act in a way shines. Uh, the range of exceptions that have been made in copyright law in India for a wide range of uses, and we are only highlighting four or five of them. The right to research as a personal use exception, the right to education as an educational exception, the disability exception that was very importantly introduced in the 2012 amendment, uh, the library exception, and the exception which is basically about criticism and review, etc. If one were to take only a handful of these, and there are many much, there are many more uh, in Section 52, how are they to be interpreted? In the Delhi University photocopy case, and for those who don't know, basically the largest publishers in the world brought a case against a small photocopy shop located in Delhi School of Economics called Rameshwari Photocopy Service. And they alleged that the provision of photocopies by way of course packs were illegal because they commercially harmed the publishers and that there was a quantitative restriction that had to be set on the number of copies that could be provided. And most importantly, you had to have a very narrow understanding of education. So according to the publishers, a teacher could make a copy of an extract of a reading, give it to the student in class, and then take the reading back. That was their understanding of what an educational exception was. So in the Delhi photocopy case, there were two judgments that were delivered, one by a single judge bench by Justice Endlaw and one by a division bench. Many things in the judgment, I don't want to get into it, but one small thing that I want to leave you with. Justice Endlaw says that copyright law is not a natural right. Copyright is not a natural right. Copyright is a statutory right. If it's a statutory right, it has to be circumscribed by the laws of a country, both in terms of the Copyright Act as well as the Constitution, but more importantly by the needs uh, of that country in terms of what is articulated in the exceptions that have been made. He goes on to say that, you know, if the law allows you to do something, in this case a very crucial thing, you buy a copy of a book, you're a library, why are you allowed to lend a copy of that book? Right? There are reasons why you're allowed to lend it without any restrictions that can be placed on you. This is very different from the entire world of electronic databases and electronic books where you're not really selling a book to someone. You're only selling them a license or a subscription to use a digital version. So one interesting question that arises, of course, is that if I were to be able to digitize a book, would I be able to lend a digital copy of the same book? in the way that I was allowed to do with a physical book. Uh, now, in the case of end laws judgment, something very interesting happens. He locates the entire interpretation of copyright law in his own experiences. This is as a law student, when I was in Delhi University, I would go to the library and I would actually, like you know, the English teacher from St. Joseph's, uh, copy down paragraphs and copy down passages. And he says, if I have a mobile phone that allows me to take a picture of it, does it alter the fact that I'm, again, actually reproducing it for a particular reason. And that reason is education. It's research. If I were to be able to photocopy the entire, uh, you know, let's say a chapter of the book or the entire book, would it make a difference if the reason remained the same? And the question that we are asking, I suppose, and opening out is, if you were allowed, if you were able to digitize a book and the reason for it remains the same, namely education, uh, research, etc., would it make a difference that it were in a digital and not merely in a physical format? There are a range of very interesting kind of questions that arise, and I don't think that these are merely legal questions. Of course, they take a legal form, and it's important to engage with it in that sense. But let's take, for example, under the Copyright Act, there's a very important exception given to libraries to make a digital copy of any lawfully acquired book that you have. So let's say you have 100 books in, in, let's say, the BIC library. You are, by law, allowed to make a digital copy as a backup for purposes of preservation and storage. But what happens if this library were unfortunately to burn down? 
would you be allowed to reprint or to print copies of, of from your digital version? Or would you just be you know, happy to have your digital version in your, in your computer? So one way of understanding this is to ask really, what is the purpose behind these exceptions? What does the purpose of interpretation of these provisions actually mean? And again, justice end law actually allows us that through the Delhi University photocopy case, saying that you know, it doesn't matter in terms of quantity. It doesn't matter whether there is an intermediary. It doesn't matter if there is incidental commercial use. The only real question that remains is, what is the purpose of that act? In that sense, the Servants of Knowledge project is an attempt at highlighting that the idea behind a lot of the activities undertaken under the project is really for the promotion of democratic ideals enshrined within the Constitution, common decency principles of what should be accessible to people uh, on an equitable basis. Uh, and we are arguing that that is really, in some ways, the purpose of many of these projects. One of the great um, lines that Carl has come up with uh, being you know, a Gandhian is scanning is the new spinning. Uh, and so I think that you know, this is uh, a way of asking then if scanning is the new spinning, um, in what are the ways in which we should think of copyright both as bondage and as freedom? I'll stop here for now. I'm sure there'll be many more uh, things that we can talk about in the Q&A. Yeah? So I'll hand it over to Om, who's really the you know, beating heart behind this project and responsible for all of the logistical stuff that's happening. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Lawrence. Hi, everyone. So I've been associated with uh, Servants of Knowledge for almost five years now, and I've been, uh, I was introduced to Carl, I think, in 2018 by Arjun Rao Chawla, talking about how he has been making knowledge accessible to public. So during that time, we were in search of uh, <coughs> references for writing a lot of uh, Canada Wikipedia pages. We, didn't, we never used to find anything that we can actually like quote for our articles. Right? And during the same time, we were trying to build language technology for our language to see how we can go back in time and see what was written in our books, what was written in our manuscripts, how we can actually get to know how, uh, how our language words were uh, born. Right? So what is the f root word for the word? Uh, and which all literatures are really making a social difference, and so many other things. Majorly, I was actually interested in Vachana Sahitya, which was uh, written in 10th, 11th, and 12th century by peop common people like you and me. Right? And even today, we tend to actually access Vachanas to uh, learn a lot from that. In day to day's life, it makes a lot of difference to us. And, and we were able to digitize them and make it accessible to public by using a lot of uh, technology, coding, development, and stuff like that. But we didn't have OCR and other advanced technologies like what we have today. But when I met Carl, I found that, OK, Digital Library of India was there, it was not accessible. We had that issue. We had the corpus of Digital Library of India, uh, Canada coll collection. And people were not able to easily access the uh, metadata of that for various reasons. And then we thought of doing crowdsourcing uh, of uh, the metadata. So in a in couple of weeks, we were able to get almost uh, 6,500 books indexed properly in Canada. Then when I met Carl, I found that he has already done so much with Indian literature, and it is already made available for public through Internet Archive. Then we started interacting. We started explaining what we actually want to do with literature related to local languages. Then we found that the Indian Academy of Sciences had a scanner which was not used. And we ended up uh, uh, collaborating as a community to see how we can actually make use of the technology that was, that was already there. Then later we found that just uh, being a community it does not work. We have to keep that machine running. So scanning is the new spinning, but who will keep spinning it? Right? So we, we wanted to ensure that the books are not troubled, not destroyed. And uh, we wanted to uh, take that book back to the shelf in the same condition. So Internet Archive gave us the very right tool, technology, and Carl's guidance helped us rethink what we wanted to do with archival. So that's how we started. I took 
the books that I had from my collection, my own collection, so the second-hand books that we found from 90s, uh, 1950s, 40s, 60s, uh, 60s, and then we found that, okay, we don't have any problems with these, we don't have another copy of these books, then we started talking to people. Why don't you open up your cupboards and see what books you actually want to preserve? There are books that are being destroyed, there are books that we have never heard of, and majorly the science and technology are maths related content. So that is what we were interested in. So when we started talking about it, people came forward to share the books that they had in their shelves. So that's how we started off. We scanned uh, Kannada, Malayalam, Telugu, and we got some very interesting uh, community collaborations. Like we got some books from uh, the border of Pakistan and uh, Punjab, and we got Sindhi books from there and we were able to scan them. So we made them accessible. And meanwhile, we started working on making use of OCR technology to uh, see if we can search within the books. That gave us a different type of power altogether. So what we tried to do with uh, literature back in 2010 to 13, with a lot of coding and development, we could do that in few minutes by using OCR technology. So Google Vision API helped us uh, achieve uh, that to one level. Then we worked with Sushant, and we were able to like see that, OK, it makes a lot of sense to OCR all the stuff that we have put up on Internet Archive. Then later, we got Tesseract playing a big role. And uh, today, anything and everything that we actually digitize through our scanners and make it available on Internet Archive gets OCR automatically. So almost 140 plus languages are OCR today. Uh, using Tesseract, and you won't believe the type of responses that we have got from the community. We have digitized 50 years of Kasturi magazines from 1940s, and we are scanning the 100 years of Karmavira magazine. And we have some very interesting uh, collections that we have created, for example, Ekshigana collection. So we got a lot of books from coastal Karnataka, and uh, uh, while working with Vishwakonkani Center, we scanned almost 4,500 books related to Konkani. So those are made available. And we have the largest Tulu books collection available on, under uh, Servants of Knowledge. So all these things happen because of the community collaborations and people who really wanted to preserve the literature and make it accessible to the public. While working on this, the biggest challenge that we had was uh, the copyright and the permissions and rights. So in many cases, we wanted to be very uh, sure that we have the permissions for uh, scanning those books. So initially, we approached the authors, or uh, authors themselves approached us, saying that we, I want to make my book accessible to public for free. So that is the type of responses that we started getting in very early stages of Servants of Knowledge. We have Dr. Uh, uh, T.R. Antramu, who, who gave away 40, 50 books related to science in Canada, and we released them under Creative Commons license. Even before all this, in 2010, we had worked with uh, GT Narayan Rao's family to release all his books under Creative Commons license. That was the very first collection of content that was made available. And when we recreated uh, similar effort through Servants of Knowledge, we were able to scan the original first edition of those books and put them available uh, for public. So that is what gave us the base. People understood that we need to preserve the old books, we need to make the books accessible to the public, otherwise it does not make sense. Meanwhile, they also, the families and the authors also approached publishers to give us permission to scan them. That was the other major thing that actually happened. So that helped us gain access to some of the very interesting magazines that, was, that were never seen by uh, uh, people who were born in 80s, 90s also. Right? So we went to Navakarnarka publications. We were able to uh, digitize almost 20 years of their Rosatu magazine. Today it is available. Not just the literary content, but also political content. That is available online. Similarly, when we were approached by a family member of uh, uh, Pavem Acharya, we found that he was an uh, editor for many different uh, um, newspapers and magazines. And he himself used to write in five, six different uh, uh, titles. And that gave us an access to 50 years of Kasturi magazine. If you really want to go back and see how science was communicated to the common man, right, from various different parts of the country, that is the major example. And other, uh, as I mentioned, the OCR helped us go inside the book and find out what was written in 
which time. So it, it really created a time machine for our language, not just for Kannada, but also for the rest of the Indian literature that we digitize through Servants of Knowledge. Today, we build these scanners here, and we operate at the rate of 45 to 50,000 pages uh, scans a day. Okay, so every month we are almost, uh, every month we are hitting 12 lakh pages. Last year we did one crore pages uh, overall under the Servants of Knowledge. So this wouldn't have happened if we, if we wouldn't have discussed uh, these matters as a community, as someone who is really interested in public domain, open access and open knowledge uh, people. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Om. Uh, he has done an amazing job managing that scanning operation. So I, I want to close with a few comments, and then we're going to open up for question and answer. And my, I will put it to you that every generation has an opportunity. Right? If you were in the 1950s, maybe you worked on aircrafts, or um, you know, in the 20s you were working on radio. And today, I think universal access to knowledge is, is the great promise of, of our generation. Um, and I, I think, as you can see, servants of knowledge, uh, there's really th three threads here. We're all pretty technical. Uh, doesn't mean everybody has to be technical, but, but in order, if you want to put knowledge online, you need that technical base. Because I, and, and you needed it in, in the last century. If you were printing books, that was very technical, right? How to typeset, what kind of paper, what kind of ink. And so the technical skills are important. The research skills are important. What knowledge is out there? What needs to be preserved? And then you need to know the law. And that's why we work with people like Lawrence Liang, um, to understand what's out there and what are we allowed to do. Can we scan an in-copyright book and give it to a student in the course of their education? Can we scan any book and make it available to the visually impaired? The answer to those is are yes. Um, so in addition to this range of uses available, this careful analysis of what's there, uh, that allows us to question authority. Because often people will look at copyright and they will say, it's an absolute right. I have copyright over this material, go away. And you know, I've written nine books. And I've had publishers say, oh, you've got a one sentence quote in here from another book. Did you get permission? No, I didn't get permission. I don't need permission. I'm able to do that. Um, and I'm constantly, I've got over 6,000 videos of the United States government in the FedFlix collection. Um, those are public domain because in the US, works of the United States government have no copyright. I'm constantly getting queries from video producers saying, I love that video, will you give me a license? I say, no, I won't give you a license. It's public domain. Go ahead and use it. And so you need to know that. So one of the things we do is, is we know the law, and we're working with places like the National Law School with copyrighted materials. But a lot of what we do is we go look for public domain material that's out there. So US federal government, you know, work that's prior to 1927, work that's out of copyright, uh, work that is absolutely vital, and we can find the copyright owner and say, you know, you're not using this. Other people might be interested. You know, many people don't write books to make money. They might think they're going to make money. Most authors don't. But most authors want fame and glory. They, they want their words out there for other people to hear. Um, so Lawrence um, accused me of being a Gandhian, um, uh, guilty. <laughs> and you know, Gandhi told us that we're, we're never property owners, we're trustees. And he taught us that we must do bread labor every day. And, and for him, that, that was spinning. And actually, I don't know if you know this, but bread labor in the original days, in the ashrams in South Africa, everybody at the ashrams there had to print every day. They had a printing press. Uh, Gandhi was the consummate blogger in the early days. Uh, he was constantly bringing in information from other places, typesetting it, putting it back out. That's how we won the fight in South Africa, by disseminating knowledge. Uh, but then the other thing he did as he moved into, the, in, into India is he began spinning because he felt it was really important that India gain control and that's because the, the, the great cotton mills uh, out there in England were, were taking the raw materials, processing them, and then selling them back in. And so for him, scanning was, was a duty. And I put it to you that today scanning is a new spinning. Um, so I hope you have questions. There's an audience mic here. Please... Um, 
please go, go ahead and come on up. If you don't ask questions, we'll ask you questions. Um, but please, please, um, uh, it's an open discussion at this point. So anybody? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, what are the laws uh, around scanning uh, personal materials of people who you don't know? For instance, uh, diaries or, um, you know, who owns that material and how does one deal with it? <clears throat> Diaries and letters are actually a very interesting example that actually um, illustrate the dis difference between tangible and intangible property. So for example, if I were to write a letter to you, or no, my letters wouldn't be worth much. Let's assume a celebrity wrote a letter to you. Let's say Lady Diana wrote a letter to you. What can you do with the letter? Who owns the letter, right? Uh, could you tear the letter if you didn't like the content of it? Of course you can. Could you burn the letter? Of course you can. Could you auction the letter at Sotheby's? Yes, you can because you're the owner of the letter. Could you republish the letter? No, you can't. Right? So that, that's interesting here because basically that's the difference between the tangible and the intangible. You may be the owner of the physical property or the physical copy of a book, but you are not necessarily the owner of the copyright in the book. Right? The copyright remains Lady Diana's till such time that the copyright exists. But of course, then the question that arises is, being the copyright owner, and this is what Carl said, does it mean that Lady Diana has absolute rights uh, as a copyright owner, or are there other exceptions and limitations that actually begin to kick in? Right? Um, in the realm, for example, of what is known as exceptions and limitations, there are a whole range of possibilities. Some of them are determined by quantum. Right? Um, let's assume I wanted to reproduce a part of the letter. Uh, what would, how much would I be entitled to doing? The second is by, by intention or purpose. What is the purpose of reproducing, let's say, a part of the letter, scanning it and making it available? Uh, thing. Uh, or if you had to say, who are the actors involved? If I'm doing it, for example, in the context of, let's say, an educational institution or a research institution, uh, the best story in the history of copyright is really the most bizarre story in some ways is the battle over Kafka's legacy. Right? As we all know very well, Kafka's works were left to Max Brod, his friend, his biographer, and his you know, documenter of everything. And the instruction that Kafka had left behind for Max Brod was, burn everything I've ever written. Now, that was a very clear instruction. As a lawyer, I can tell you, you know, it was a valid instruction as a will. Max Brod was legally obliged to burn everything that Kafka had ever written. Thankfully, Max Brod was not the most law-abiding person. Um, and Max Brod said that, you know, I've known Kafka, and I've known Kafka better than anyone else has. Forget, you know, the trial and America and castle. If Kafka ordered something in a restaurant, I wrote it down, because I recognized the genius in this man. And I also knew he's a drama queen. He didn't really want me to burn the material, right? I mean, he just, he, he was being, so, so I know better than you that Kafka didn't really intend this. So what does, Kafka, what does Max Brod do? Max Brod takes everything that Kafka has ever written, boards the last train to leave Prague before Prague is taken over by the Nazis. If he had not boarded that train, it was in all likelihood, just like Kafka's sisters uh, died you know, in, 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 in the concentration camps, that Max Brod would have died, and along with it would have been Kafka. Max Brod goes, of course, you know, uh, goes to Israel, becomes a Zionist, uh, and gets into a relationship with his secretary, Esther Hoff. And after he dies, he wills whatever is remaining of, Ma of Kafka's writings to Esther Hoff. Esther Hoff passes away and then wills it to her two daughters. And then a Kafkaesque drama plays out. Because what happens is the two daughters live in a house with 24 cats and a trunk full of the unseen writings of Kafka. They offer to sell it to the German Literary Archive. The German Literary Archive claims to be the legitimate heir of Kafka's writings because they have all of Kafka's writings, and after all, Kafka wrote in German. This is objected to by Israel, saying that no, Kafka is Israeli property. After all, he was Jewish. The two women say that, well, this is a private property because we are the owners of all of this material. right? The only people who didn't really take part in this, unfortunately, was Czechoslovakia. Uh, you say that you know, he was from Prague, uh, but they didn't have the money to participate in this long lawsuit. But this lawsuit went on for a long time, and the question was, who is the, who is the rightful owner of Kafka? 
So the, there is a complicated kind of set of questions involved in the question of what do you do with uh, memory, right? What do you do with diaries, letters, anonymous? And I think that it's both as much an ethical question as it is a legal question. There are questions of privacy. There are questions in a way of uh, propriety, not merely questions of property that are involved over here. Let's assume we take care of this. Uh, then the property question actually gets a little more diminished to my mind. The problem is when articulated only as a property question, which is what copyright unfortunately does. And I think that a larger perspective on, on this, which brings all of this together, uh, would make it in a way a question worthy of, let's say, a Kafkaesque you know, rumination, rather than some boring bureaucratic legal approach to it. Let me add one point on that one. Um, copyright expires on everything. Right? It's not forever. It's not infinite. It may seem infinite with the current copyright laws. So if you've got a diary, you can scan it. You may not be able to post it, but you should scan it and preserve it. Um, and then you've got that, and you are a trustee of that knowledge. And at some point, you'll be able to make it public. But, but if you've got those diaries of someone else, you should preserve them. And, and you know the physical copy might get burned. It might go away. So you have a duty to scan that and, and keep it forever. In India, it's 60 years after the death of the author. Right. Uh, there is no standard time limit across the world. In the US, for example, it's a different time. And part of the reason, um, the, uh, there's only one real kind of reason for why the timeline of copyright has constantly got extended, uh, and that's Mickey Mouse. So yes. it's every time Mickey Mouse's okay. copyright has, uh, has expired, yeah. the US has extended it. We have two more questions lined up here. My question is for Carl. Uh, I think the uh, Internet Archive was successfully uh, sued recently about their national emergency library. And I saw a lot of hand wringing at that time about the future of the Internet Archive itself. But my question is a bigger one about how you're thinking about long term uh, digital preservation and access. So the Internet Archive was sued for their controlled digital lending. And it's based on the idea that I've got a physical copy, I scanned it, I put the physical copy on a shelf. I loan the digital copy. That's called the own to loan ratio, right? If I've got one copy, I can loan one copy at a time. Then they would loan an encrypted version to you for a limited period of time, and then it, it would expire. You, you'd check it back in, and then the next person would, would borrow it. And when COVID hit, Brewster Kale, who founded the Internet Archive, felt very strongly that, that education is, is a right, and, and libraries all over the world were closed. And he removed the home to loan ratio, and he called that the National Emergency Library. So he had one copy, and he loaned it to as many people simultaneously as wanted to read it. Turned out it wasn't that many people, but the publishers went bananas. And they sued him, the four largest publishers, uh, not only for the National Emergency Library, but for the concept of controlled digital lending itself. Um, and he lost at the initial level of the district court. The ju judge just didn't buy it. Um, he said, control digital lending, no. If publishers want to make an ebook, they'll sell an ebook, and you can't make an ebook out of the physical book. They are different things, and you are competing with their market. That's a district court decision. I, I must say, in my lawsuits, right, I was sued for posting the laws of Georgia. Um, I was found guilty at the district court level. They said I was a commercial operation. We are strictly nonprofit. Uh, they, they said we lost on these nebulous four uses you have in the United States. We went to the Court of Appeals. We won. We went to the Supreme Court. We won. Um, and my advice to Brewster was the higher up you go, the more a judge is willing to, to look at that. Now, there, there's two, two, two questions that you really asked there. What's the future of the Internet Archive, right? Uh, so all the books they scan can be made available to the visually impaired globally. That continues. They have many other things. Millions of books, uh, public domain, that continues. Uh, they have a TV archive. They have a radio archive. They have the Great 78 Collection, right? So all of that continues. Long term, uh, survivability is the key, right? And I've learned, I've been working on the internet for probably 40 years now. If you have one copy of something, it will go away. And we've learned that with real libraries. Library of Alexandria, gone. Libraries in Germany, gone. Uh, other libraries, you know, it's termites, it's floods, it's fire, it's whatever. So you need multiple copies. Lots of copies keeps things safe. So if you're interested in long-term 
archiving, you need to propagate that data. So all our data that we scan is on the Internet Archive, but we have preservation copies. We have multiple preservation copies. Even if the great earthquake hits the Bay Area, um, even if things like that happen, our data will survive. And again, that's one of your technical responsibilities as a librarian, as a trustee, uh, to preserve that material. I just wanted to add uh, one dimension to this, which illustrates the difference between the US you know, copyright standards and Indian copyright law. One of the grounds in the Hatchet case, which is the Internet Archive case, uh, was the question of, you know, can you digitize at all? Uh, and this is grounded on two judgments, which is the Google Book case and the Hathi you know, Trust case. And what was the requirement in both of these cases in terms of a standard that had been established was that there was a necessity of what is known as transformative authorship that you were doing something that radically changed. So the argument in Google, for example, is snippet view search is a, rat, is a transmittive authorship. And in the case of you know, the hatchet, they arrived at the conclusion that there wasn't sufficient transmittive authorship. In Indian copyright law, you don't even need it because there is actually an exception provided for every library to automatically have the right to digitize what they already own. So it's a different threshold question. Right? Uh, so, and that is you know, a fundamental difference between the two. So, and I think that you know, in, in, in the long run, as Carl said, hopefully even within the US system, uh, on appeal it will change. But in India, we actually have a lot more flexibility. So in the US, you do it, you roll the dice. You hope you don't get sued. If you get sued, it goes to the judge, and the judge does this four-factor analysis. In India, you, you can still get sued for anything, no matter what. Right? Uh, but if you're doing it in the course of instruction, you've got a lot more, um, a, a lot more feeling that what you're doing is okay, right? Because that's listed in the <coughs> act. There, there's another difference. In the United States, uh, the Copyright Act has evolved as a statutory creature, um, including things like this fair use analysis. In India, the Copyright Act is deeply rooted in the fundamental rights of the Indian Constitution. Um, it, it is not just a copyright act. It, it is an expression of the fundamental values. And, and so you have a stronger leg to stand on in many cases when you're doing things. But most importantly, you have these exceptions. You say, hey, this is my research use. And I'm not sharing it, but I am making a copy for my research use. You're probably OK on that. You're not rolling the dice and waiting for a judge to do a four-factor analysis on you. So next question, please. Yeah. Um, genealogy, diaries, religion. I have some, I'm in possession of uh, diaries, notes, a lot of works from missionaries who converted one of my ancestors. Um, I, don't, um, I don't validate some of the views. Now, I would like to publish uh, family history, OK? very carefully, because there's a lot of controversy because there are some members of the family all over the world, including America, uh, who will definitely not be in agreement. So my question, or they will sue, of course they will sue. So <laughs> my question is, uh, who holds the copyright? I am in physical possession of these uh, books and diaries, but once I publish, I mean, I want to know, okay, just can you, can you elaborate on what could happen? Okay, a couple of questions. I, um how old are these things? More than 60. One of the diaries is definitely more than 60 years old. It's about 80 years old, 80, 90. Are the people alive? No, they're not alive. <laughs> oh. So it's, <clears throat> uh, so calculation has to be on, there isn't a single answer, it's, right. it's work to work. Um, so when you say, for example, it's 60 years after the death of the author, uh, in, uh, in which case there is no copyright. If you're, the physical, if you're the owner of the physical copy of the book, effectively, you can digitize it, put it up, et cetera. There's no claim that even arises. In borderline cases, for example, let's assume that you know, it isn't 60 years since the death of someone and the material is, is there. Uh, you're in physical, you know, you're, you're the owner of, of the thing. There are a couple of questions that would arise. Copyright is not an automatic right, right? Copyright is a statutory right, and there are various threshold criteria defined to what qualifies for copyright protection. So for example, an original work is a minimum qualification. Now originality here doesn't mean you know, Wordsworthy and originality, it just means point of origin. So in this case, the, even if you've written a, a, a diary with very little original thought, it would be an original work. So it is the subject matter of copyright. 
The question is, what is the scope and extent to which protection could be claimed? In your case, if you're writing, let's say, a family uh, history, and you're not using the entire diary in terms of reproducing it necessarily, no problem at all in terms of usage, right? Uh, because the second threshold criteria in copyright is what is known as basically the quantum. Uh, so there's something called, you know, a quotation right. Why are you allowed to quote, for example, in journal articles or in books? Because the quantum is so small that it does not actually alter in any way the original work. Second, Section 521A1 of the Copyright Act has a very, 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 very important exception, which is personal use, including research, followed by, for the purposes of, criticism and review. The words criticism and review are very, very broadly defined. They haven't really, they, they are the subject of various cases in India. Uh, and the courts in India have basically said that any work that is used in conversation with another work is absolutely fine. So if you're doing scholarly work, you're absolutely good to go. It's only when you're reproducing the entire work in a digital form that you would want to be a little cautious about the copyright question. Not because the dead ancestor has a problem, but the dead relative me. I mean, the living relative me. So connected to that, can I ask about the research? The research material that I would extensively want to use is, he, I mean, tons of pages of, uh, you know, shall I say, literature and praise of one particular religion. Yeah. Religion is extremely controversial. I don't abide by that at all, but it would, the research would have to quote that. Yeah, no problem yeah. at all. Yeah, okay. You're absolutely well within your rights to, to, to use it. All right, great, great, thanks. Okay, good, uh, so the next question, please. And, and, and uh, when it comes to, to copyright-specific issues, um, it's often, you know, a fact-based thing. So uh, this session is not necessarily a clinic on, on you know, <laughs> each and every use, but we're, we're more than happy to discuss the, the general principles on things. But, but each thing, uh, the issue is, no matter what you do, you could always get sued. Um, but if you're on a strong ground, right, if what you're doing you think is good, um, and you've thought about it, and you've done a little bit of research on copyright, you should stand your ground, right, because you're probably okay. And in many cases, you're not going to get sued, right? So if you've got some what's called an orphan work, right, it's a book from, you know, 1930, Right. Um, maybe it hasn't been 60 years since the death of the author. Uh, maybe it's been 55 years. Uh, it's out of print. It's not commercially available. Uh, at least in my case, I'm probably willing to take that risk. Um, you know, it's a risk, though. So it's a risk. So, next question, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'll begin by thanking the Internet Archive, the Library of Congress, and all you gentlemen for helping me uh, take the Constitution of India to a wide range of people, uh, because that's where I found the best uh, uh, digital scans of the Constitution of India. Nobody else in India seemed to have uh, good uh, usable versions of it. So that's just one use case of uh, this. But coming to the question, uh, do you I have two questions? One, do you foresee um, National Portrait Gallery versus Wikimedia kind of a thing in India with the kind of work that you're doing, especially, say, for example, some work of uh, Ravi Varma's or other artwork, do you foresee that happening, that playing out here? And the second question is more to do with uh, AI-generated uh, uh, material, particularly about, uh, say, the authorship and ownership of the new content that's generated. Uh, it, what if the content is, if it's public domain, I mean, uh, the AI is fed with domain from public content, uh, domain, content from a public domain should be fine, but um, what if AI is, um, picked up some, uh, has been fed some copyrighted material, and then future uh, authorship and ownership issues. Uh, don't you see that as a uh, cause for concern? So I get a lot of AI questions. Um, so if you're taking somebody's copyrighted image, right, it's on a website, it's copyrighted, and you're ingesting it, and you can make a derivative work. It's a picture of Snoopy that Andy Warhol did, and you're adding other things. Now, you've made a derivative work. You've probably, you the dot-com Silicon Valley folks, have probably violated the copyright. And there's some very significant issues there. And I can tell you in the United States, the, the content owners, right, the, the, particularly the, the kind of IP maximalists, right, the Hollywood, and, and uh, they're up in arms. 
and that's going to battle out um, over time. Uh, and and you know the AI stuff right now it's it's flavor of the month, and I think some of that hype is is going to die down a bit. And 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 in terms of the portraits, I don't know. Um, the, the the big thing we always try to do is avoid the controversy, and so we look for things that pretty much everybody agrees ought to be available. Um, and as a general rule, occasionally. I get people getting upset about some of the stuff we've put online. We usually send them back a letter. Right? We don't ignore them. Uh, we don't say rude things. We send them a long, considered letter about why we did it, why it's important, the mission of their organization, and why we think it ought to be available. Um, so, I, I mean, so the answer is I don't know. And, and, and again, it's, it's, a, it's something you just have to look at. And, and at the end of the day, you make your best judgment. And again, anybody can sue anybody over anything in India and in the United States. Um, and you're just trying to do it in a way that, and particularly if the content you've picked, everybody agrees is okay. But even if it's controversial, um, you should know enough of the law that you, you kind of know where you are. But you're always rolling the dice. My stuff is always what's called an issue of first impression. It's never been done before. And so if, the, if you go to a lawyer and you say, am I allowed to do that, the answer is it depends. Or the answer is don't do it because who knows. Um, okay. So I'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Sushant Sinha, who is in the audience. He works very closely with us. I've worked with Sushant for a long time now. Um, he is a key contributor to, to our effort. Um, and, and so I, I just wanted to recognize him here. So do we have more questions? Please, microphone. Sir. Yeah. So uh, ethically, I wanted to ask, like legally, I understand where controlled digital lending is coming from. But uh, according to all three of you, what does the future of this looks like? This one is to one ratio. This has been currently been put up because of the lending system. So what ethically, where do you think this looks like, like 10 years, 20 years down the line, if you feel there can be like more people requiring more copies, but they are bound by the 14 day window? So, uh, yeah, look, look, controlled digital lending is not dead. There was a district lower court opinion in the United States. The EU Court of Justice uh, many years ago issued an advisory opinion to the, to the Netherlands saying it's allowed. Yeah. Right? We're, we're pretty sure controlled digital lending to a student in the course of their education in India is allowed. It's new. Anything new people are going to like complain about. Um, but the question is, are you on solid ground? I think 10 years from now, um, look, print books are, are you know, getting destroyed. Uh, they're going away. Uh, I, I know in the future a lot of content, you won't be able to own it. You're going to have to lease the ebook. Yes. Um, but we're pretty sure that a whole back file there needs to be copied. It needs to be digitized. Yeah. And we're pretty sure we're going to be able to loan it to you. Or eventually, like I said, all copyright expires. Right? So if nothing else, you scan it now and, and you know, at some point it becomes available. And so what will the future be? I don't know. But one of the ways we can change the future is to continue scanning and putting information online and being a yeah. balance to the people that are, I own all knowledge, right? And, and we have some big publishers that are in, the, in that camp. Yeah. And we, we have to stand up. Right. Yeah, that's what I was uh, pointing towards, that this one is to one ratio of a physical book to a digital copy. Now, we've read so far from what I've heard, like, We've had mechanisms in place, so uh, why not? Why can't it be a one is to ten? Like why can't it be a one is to twenty people? So that's where you know it's because Michelle Wu at Georgetown came up with the own to loan ratio. She yeah. was the librarian there, and that sounds good to us, and it sounds safe. Uh, it's that's easy to explain to people, and so that's what we're doing today. So the question in the course of of education in India, does it have to be an own to loan ratio? Mm. I don't know. Uh, but it's pretty safe if you start there, we yeah, think. Yeah, we think. But again, maybe some people won't think that way. But we're, we're pretty sure that's okay. Um, so and again, yeah. I want to comment on do. this. Um, <clears throat> if 10 years ago you'd asked the question of whether in the course of instruction I could photocopy an entire book and give it to my student, mm -hmm. or am I bound by, let's say, a number of chapters, uh, as, for example, is the course packs scenario in the US. The, our answer would probably have been that, oh, no, I don't think any court is going to allow you an, the reproduction of an entire book. But then you can have the De Delhi University photocopy case where the court said, we don't want to go into a discussion of, of quantitative restrictions because you can't draw a fine line. 
at what point of time can you argue that, well, only chapter one was needed for this particular class and not chapter two? Instead, we're only going to go into a fact-to-fact -fact basis on which you say, what was the purpose? If the purpose was education, the Copyright Act does not lay down any quantitative restriction. Now, on, on own to loan, there's similar incrementally one would have to say that let's begin with the assumption of own to loan. Let's assume that you have a consortium of libraries, in which case the number of copies you own can also exponentially grow. Right? So if you have a consortium of libraries and you say that we have you know, 50 copies of Granville Austin's Working a Democratic Constitution, the hell has that changed? Does the fact of a consortium make a difference? These are all open-ended questions at the moment. Uh, we will both err on the side of caution, but not allow us ourselves to be subsumed by the presumption of what the law might be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes laws are wrong, right? I mean, there was a law saying you're not allowed to make salt, right? Well, people made salt. And that law went away. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Uh, please come up to the microphone if you have questions. So it's a bit like my earlier question, but what about works where you don't know who the author is? You find stuff, but you know, like, uh, yeah, find stuff that's, you know. Uh, I don't know, how old's, but, the, how old's the work? I mean, it could be from the 40s, 50s, it's tough to know. Um, and if it's, Ethically, again, borderline, but it's important for Is research. it a printed book or is it a handwritten thing? It's or a, a painting, hand-drawn paintings and uh, pornography, actually. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, so pornography is very interesting in Indian uh, law because pornography doesn't really have a status because one of the problems was that it was argued that if you gave copyright protection to pornography, you would be promoting porn pornography. So for a very long time, pornography didn't have copyright. Uh, and so it remains in that kind of border zone. But you know, on the question of anonymous works, uh, just like in all the poetry books that we studied in school where the greatest contributor was Anon, Anon is an acknowledged author under the Copyright Act uh, and has rights, etc. But again, as Carl said, more often than not a practical question. And with copyright, the rule is very simple. Just appear, don't ask. And particularly don't ask a lawyer because they'll say you can't do it. So do it, and then if you need to, talk to the lawyer. Yeah, but do it carefully. I, I mean, so, you know, for example, I've been doing this for a very long time, and I, I can probably take more risks than you should be taking if, if you have something. Um, so you should be a bit conservative, uh, but you keep, you keep doing it. And, and again, you look at the nature of the material and what are you going to do with it. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you roll the dice, and you try to do it in a way that, that is relatively safe. So uh, next question, please. Thanks, uh, Carl Lawrence and uh, Shibu. My question was for Shibu. Uh, you know, there's a lot of old magazines that you've scanned, and uh, there's a lot of different language texts, right? One question was, uh, other than people approaching you to say, you know, can you scan this? How do you decide what you're scanning? And do you know who has been accessing these scanned texts? Like, for example, some of the old Kannada magazines that you've been scanning, and uh, you know, the Vachanas, of course, I think widely it's been accessed. But the other texts, do you know who's accessing it, and like? why they're accessing it, and these are the two questions. Okay. Uh, technically, we are not tracking who is accessing it, because we want everybody to use it. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. For that, we have a lot of stories, a lot of uh, social share that actually happens, a lot of message that we actually get from word, word of mouth. It comes back to us. Right? People say that, yes, I did found this particular article on Servants of Knowledge. Then they actually start talking what we digitize, what we scan. Then they realize that the book that they found was scanned by us. Okay? And when we actually uh, when we take up any work, first we'll see if at all it is there in public domain or not. That is the first criteria. Otherwise, if it is published by a specific publisher, we try to approach them. So that's how the local Shikshana Trust Hubli's work were digitized completely. Because Pavem Acharya used to be an editor for that for decades. And his family reached out to them, not even us. The, they, they learned what we were doing. They realized the value of the digitization and the need for the archival of the works. And then they wanted us to, they came up with a diary which had all his writings uh, with uh, the paper cuttings and so many other things. We said, why should we actually do this? Why don't we do the complete book itself, or complete magazine itself? Then they said, OK, we can try doing that, because he was there for decades. And they all understand his contribution to the land and literature. And 
uh, all that we told the Loka Shikshana Trust is that anything and everything that we digitize will be made available for public. Are you okay with that? Are you okay to give access to the content? Are you okay to share the volumes that you have in your library which is uh, getting destroyed? Right? So we had books sent from Hubli, which were uh, printed in 1940s, 1920s, right? And we were not able to handle some of them, and, but still we took efforts, we put efforts to digitize them. And when they started seeing that, they found that they, they, they're not just seeing the old copies in a digital format, but they're also able to do further research for their continued uh, publication. So Kasuri found 50-year-old Nagesh Agade's article, uh, and they celebrated that. They said, you had written your first article on Karma, uh, the Kasturi magazine, and we found it today. And that happened because we actually enabled them with technology. And when they keep hearing in these stories from different authors and uh, general public, and those people have been going back to those publishers, they're not coming to us. They don't really know who actually scans these books and puts up even today. So that's why we said this is our first general public meeting for sovereigns of knowledge. We have been digitizing from last four or five years, and uh, we did a lot of different type of projects. Uh, to give you a number about Kannada literature digitization that we have done, we have done more than like 70 plus projects with different publishers, authors, individual families, and all the content has, has been made available for public under Creative Commons license, or at least with certain uh, condition saying that, okay, this can be used for non-commercial purpose. So that's how the content has been made available. If you look at our overall collections on the Internet Archive, we're well over 20 crore uh, views. Um, yeah. If you look at the top 100 books on the Internet Archive, 30 of them come out of our collections, a tremendous number of users from India. Uh, so uh, Internet Archive does not log you know, who reads what, but they log uh, the aggregate where the regions are. Um, and it's clear that there's a huge amount of use from, from India on those collections. So. Yeah. We have those, another question? Oh, yeah. oh, please Sorry, finish. I just wanted to add yes, one more yes. thing. So those numbers are also very, very interesting. So as I said, we were able to approach uh, authors and publishers to release their works in Creative Commons license, right? They started observing that people are reading those books. And publishers are also seeing that those things are being accessed by people. Now some of the books are being reprinted. Because people want the physical version of those books. The publisher is also there, the author is also there. Now they are actually uh, going back to the publisher and asking for a printed copy. Can I get a printed copy? And at the same time, that also enabled us to rethink how we can actually go back and uh, bring in some very old Kannada books. We are, it has enabled us to uh, recreate some uh, old Kannada fonts. We are building revival Kannada fonts to enable OCR to uh, identify old Kannada text, not just the ones which were actually uh, printed from the computer era, but also from the lithographs and other things. So that has enabled us to do that, yes. Ma'am. Um, yes, yeah, so I have, actually I have two questions. One I'm afraid is slightly AI related, but um, is around provenance, right? And so the idea of provenance has gotten increasingly diluted through the idea of transformative works and derivative works. And so now that we are at the AI moment where you know, AI is the machine that is reading, so the reader is the machine, then what happens to the idea of provenance, right? Because when there's a source that I can recognize, that's all very well and good, and you know, then copyright is a lot more kind of about a moral right. But when there are large uh, corporations who might say, oh, this is educational use, then what happens to the idea of provenance? And the second question I have is for Shiro. So maybe we can address that and I can... Well, so when AI says this is true, um, one of the things we provide is you can go to the Internet Archive or Google and look at our website um, and, and go look at that source material and figure out whether that's true or not. So when somebody says Gandhi said this, you know, I've got the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. Um, you can go search. In fact, um, you know, be the change you wish to see. 
Gandhi it's didn't say that. Yeah, um, go search for that in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, that was a biography about him that said that. Um, so we, we are a counterpoint to these, you know, generative AI engines that are, you know, making stuff up. Uh, that's why the source materials need to be available online. So they do, the, but the problem is that people, A, don't know that's the source material, and B, they're not going to bother, right? So how, so there's a question of like say watermarking, right? Like how do we ensure that we know that a text that's traveling and being ingested by the machine comes from where it comes from? We, and so we, teach, we teach people that they should do more than simply believe Bing. Um, they should check when somebody says this is true, um, go find that source document. Not everybody will do that. Uh, that's one reason we put court cases and laws and things online. So when, when you see a quote, you can go find it. Um, and you know who are you going to believe? Um, you're going to believe an authoritative, authentic source, and we just want to put those tools up. And again, not everybody's going to do that, um, but you you can't you you can't stop stupid people from doing stupid things. But you can you can teach people how to do things better, and hope that over time uh, they will do the right thing. And, and uh, particularly reporters and others, you, you can teach them where the fundamental research um, materials are available without having to fly to the Library of Congress, without having to go to Delhi and get permission to enter the Central Secretariat Library. Um, so we, we think we're helping solve that problem. So second question. Uh, so yeah, for Shivu. Um, so obviously large language models in Indian languages are fairly limited. And I was just wondering whether you know about whether your work is being used for large language model corpuses and whether people are actually kind of making a distinction between like the age of the uh, texts that you're digitizing in the corpus. Thanks. Uh, I haven't seen people using it to that extent, but they're still learning how to use the material that we have digitized and the OCR content and text search, that itself is pretty new to uh, our people. So we show them uh, how to actually access that content, and we also keep telling, uh, telling them and reminding why we need the OCR text or the plain text format. Uh, to go back uh, a bit, so we wanted to build corpus, which can be used for creating Kannada spell checker. We didn't have that. Even today, we don't have a very good Kannada spell checker. We don't have a grammar checker. What we needed was a, ro a set of root words, which can be fed into the uh, tool, and we can use it as a uh, um, base for the spell checker. Right? So we are now trying to teach students and developers who are actually willing to come forward and work on building such tools to use the corpus that we have built with the help of public domain content and uh, take it back as a wonderful con uh, the, uh, contribution to open source projects. Yeah. And, and I, I really want to emphasize that the counter to generative AI and misinformation is having the source materials online. And, and so what we are doing is, is we're not going to solve the problem of misinformation, particularly in election cycles. Uh, we're not going to solve the problem of, of uh, generative AI engines making up you know, facts and people believing those but we are going to provide the tools that allow people to double check and to do the original research and that's something that students and journalists and researchers and lawyers and teachers and others uh, can use those resources. So we're not going to solve the problem of disinformation, but we are a, a strong counter to that. Sir. Um, so I have two questions. One is, um, uh, so. The, most of the audience that I've been working with uh, have been heavily relying on web archives, uh, the internet archive. And in many cases, maybe because of some information or some random geo that gets passed, internet archive gets shut down randomly and then it comes back up again randomly, right? Uh, and then there is also this uh, larger audience that we work with where um, uh, there is no idea of internet access, right? So what I'm looking for is, uh, as someone who is interested in how do I mirror uh, Internet Archive, right? Uh, one, has has people done it before or ha is there an internal discussion, etc. That's question number one. Uh, question number two is specifically to Shiv again is, uh, I'm more also interested in the question of uh, going beyond what knowledge, where is the knowledge coming from, to a question also of whose knowledge are we really archiving? 
Uh, for example, if you take Karnataka, there is also a language called Bari uh, that I can think of, which does not have a script. Uh, it's, it's majorly a spoken language, uh, but then there is a, a ton of knowledge that is inherent to it. Uh, if I go to Tamil Nadu, I can think of the Irulas, the Kurvas languages, uh, almost Tamil, but not Tamil. But again, again, no scripts. Uh, most of the words don't exist in Tamil, but they do tend to speak, right? So what about knowledges that are orally transmitted, uh, right? So how, f what, what of an archive of those? So, so there is, uh, I, I'll say a few words and then turn it over to, to Om. Uh, there is a, a beautiful endangered languages program that, that Arcadia funds, that, that, and, and there are a number of attempts to uh, preserve orally transmitted uh, languages, and I think that's important. As, as to the periodic unavailability of the Internet Archive, um, I believe there should be a, a major set of distributed services in India Right, and it shouldn't be one place. Um, it should be distributed in many places, and that's how you make that information continue to be available. And that's something we're trying to do. We have a very large server in Bangalore. Um, we are systematically downloading our information onto that server, learning how to serve it up. So you'll be able to go to the Internet Archive, but you'll be able to go to our servers and pull that up. That's a long-term effort. It's not easy to run these kinds of things, but we're learning how to be a library. We're learning how to do card catalogs. We're learning how to serve up images. We're thinking about the legal implications of that. Um, and we think more people ought to be doing that kind of work, but it needs to be a distributed solution. This isn't, hello, I'm gonna solve the problem. You know, big government program is gonna do a National Digital Library of India. That's a you know, well-meaning effort, by the way, and I wish them all the, all the success they have, but you need different flavors of these things up and running. And, and so to me, many different places ought to be taking, particularly the public domain materials, preserving them, serving them up in different ways. You know, maybe one place specializes in a certain language, um, but, but it, it, it requires a sustained long-term bottom-up effort to do that. Uh, Om, did you have anything to, to add? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is possible. To, as you know, uh, you can download the books from Internet Archive. Yes, definitely you can mirror it. There are tools available and a lot of things are possible. But as Carl very clearly mentioned, the legal implications and the need for uh, the resources and uh, the engineering that you need, the effort that goes into maintenance, it's, it's beyond just one person's activity, right? It requires a, a consolidated effort of multiple people. And you are actually asking about oral uh, uh, knowledge and its digitization. So there have been a lot of uh, local uh, efforts which has been uh, working on uh, uh, documenting that. We did that through Sanchi. So we tried to digitize a lot of uh, audiovisual documentation and make it available uh, for public under Creative Commons license. But under Servants of Knowledge, we are not taking up that activity. But there is a very interesting uh, stuff that you all might have seen or many of you might know. Linguistic Survey of India has done an excellent job of uh, documenting most of uh, the literature that we are actually talking about. You have Barry, you have book on Barry. And Kannada itself has a lot of dialects. All the dialects of Kannada has been very well documented by Linguistic Survey of India. And we have, I have been trying to reach out to the publishers to see if they can release it under public domain, or at least under Creative Commons license. So a collective effort from a community like this, uh, and the interaction with such uh, publishers or universities, which, which did that wonderful work to release the content to public domain, could bring them online. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question, sir. You have the honor. I'm lucky. <laughs> uh, I, I look at a very large archive of a community health uh, library, and the uh, question that keeps coming to me is, after scanning, then what? And I think you were starting to answer some of that with the last question. Uh, but uh, apart from searching through the full text and finding content, are there other ways of curating content so that it becomes more accessible, especially when talking about knowledge repository and not just an archive 
Well, metadata is particularly important. I mean, you can scan, but what's the title? What's the creator? What's the keywords? What's the description? What's the backstory about this? Um, so, you know, you've scanned it, but that's just the first step. Uh, you want to curate your collection. You want to describe the items. Uh, you want to say, gee, if you like this item, go look over there, right? And we're not doing that on, on much of our stuff. To, to some we are, but, but as a general rule, uh, you know, we're scanning and we're posting and, and we rely on other people to begin building on top of that. And again, with the Internet Archive, if you're even moderately technical, there's a command line tool. You can say IA download collection in Swaraj and the whole thing comes on down. Right, and then you can begin working with it. Um, you, you know, what you might be doing is translating works into other languages. Um, you might be taking video and making sure the closed captions are correct or translated into other languages. Uh, but, but you need that core knowledge to start with. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is getting that core scanning done, uh, but encouraging a community of people, you know, to, to do other things. Right? It's, it's like, gee, this should be done. Well, do it. Do it, and, and we'll work with you and, and try to teach you the tools or support you. Um, but you know, people say, what can I do? And it's like, pick something that other people aren't doing and, and make that your passion, right? You know, maybe you're into numistics, new, new uh, you know, coin collecting. Um, may, maybe there's not enough of that online. Well, make it your mission to go to the old bookstores, look for you know, books about coins, buy them, scan them, put them online, label them properly. Um, and I think if we all do that, right, if we want, don't depend on the large corporate publishers to solve our information needs, don't depend on the major media, right, if, if we make our own history, if we work with those materials, uh, that is going to be the true public library of India. Uh, thank you so much for coming, everybody. We really appreciate it. Um, I, I, we're going to be here again. Um, and thank you to the Bangalore International Center. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you to Carl, Lawrence, and Om for the session. For those of you who are here and for those of you who are your friends who might have missed the session, the video will be available on our YouTube in a couple of days, so do check that out. Thank you so much.